Thanks to Squarespace for helping support this episode. Hey crazies, life as we know it requires liquid water, and that's only possible on the surface of a planet if that planet is in the habitable zone of its system. Earth is right in the middle of ours, but at the inner edge you'll find Venus, and at the outer edge you'll find Mars. Of course, neither of them is habitable for the same reason, their atmospheres. Venus's thick atmosphere retains too much heat. Mars's thin atmosphere doesn't retain enough. But what if in some alternate universe, Venus formed in Mars's orbit? Would it be habitable then? This episode was made possible by the generous support of our patrons and YouTube members. I think it'll be best if we start with what Venus is like now. It's about the same size as Earth, so it can hold on to more atmosphere than Mars. And boy, does it ever. Venus's atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, or CO2. And it's super thick. The pressure is 92 times what we have on Earth. Yeah, you heard that right, 92 times. Venus will crush you like a pancake. It's really hot on the surface too, but not because it's closer to the sun. Almost no light reaches the surface. That super thick atmosphere and these shiny clouds reflect a bunch of it back into space. The reason it's so hot on the surface is because the CO2 in the atmosphere absorbs infrared light, holding in the heat. The surface temperature is a steady 870 Fahrenheit. That's 470 Celsius. Even crazier, Venus's atmosphere is so dense that it doesn't even matter if it's day or night. It's 870 Fahrenheit all the time. Imagine being covered with thousands of blankets. You'd get crushed and you'd burn up from your own body heat. If somehow you survived that, you'd still have to deal with the rain. These clouds aren't made of water like Earth clouds. They're sulfuric acid. It literally rains sulfuric acid on Venus. Is that an actual picture? Oh yeah, it is. Does that mean we landed there? Yeah, it does. These pictures were taken by one of the Soviet Venera probes during the 1970s. The Russians built a Venus lander and it lasted almost an hour. Humans rock. Anyway, Venus got that way because it's a runaway greenhouse. So actually, Venus is not in a runaway greenhouse effect. What? The term runaway greenhouse effect, it's kind of reserved for something different than just in a very strong greenhouse effect. Really? Wait. Who are you? Chris Kolaus. Dr. Chris Kolaus from the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies? Yep. Cool. Uh, what exactly do you do there? It's primarily an Earth Climate Modeling Center, but there's a, a few people that have done modeling of uh, planetary atmospheres and exoplanet interests and such. I'm part of that exoplanet modeling group. Ah, so this is definitely in your wheelhouse. Okay, so if, if Venus isn't a runaway greenhouse, then what is it? It, it, it's fair to call it strong or supercharged or, or whatever. But it's it's reached an equilibrium. It's it's done. right, right. It's an equilibrium, and it's just it's just a very hot equilibrium. So, what's a runaway greenhouse? It actually refers to a very specific process in which the outgoing radiation cannot reach the absorbed solar radiation. Oh, so so Venus had a runaway greenhouse in the past, but it has since stopped. What is thought to maybe have occurred on early Venus. Okay, so I just learned so much that my brain hurts, but I'm gonna to try to summarize. Say you've got some random planet, it doesn't matter which one. Its average surface temperature can be determined by a relatively simple equation. Incoming light from the sun minus outgoing light from the planet, which is mostly infrared. That's it. The trick is knowing what happens with those numbers under different circumstances, and that's what we're gonna to need to know if we plan on moving Venus around. Naturally, there will be less incoming light if the planet is further from the sun. Light leaving a source gets spread out over a larger and larger area as it moves away. It's called an inverse square law because the intensity drops with the square of the distance. We measure area in square units, square miles, square feet, square meters, you get the idea. Mars's orbit is a little over twice as far from the sun as Venus. If Venus formed there instead, it would receive less than a quarter of the light, which is pretty significant. 
Does that mean it would be one quarter of the temperature? Actually, no. If you put an ice cube on the counter, it'll seek an equilibrium with its warmer surroundings. For this ice cube, that means it'll eventually melt. But that ice cube is in contact with a counter and, and surrounded by air. A planet like Venus is floating in the vacuum of space. It's not in contact with anything, except the light from the sun. The intensity of that light is not proportional to temperature though. It's proportional to the fourth power of temperature, something we call the Stefan-Boltzmann law. If we wanna think of Venus as being enveloped in light, we're gonna need to factor that in. By the time the light gets to this alternate Venus, the intensity would be less than a quarter of what it is for our Venus. But the effective temperature of that light would be the fourth root of that, or about 69%. So not as cold as you might think. However, the amount of light that arrives at a planet is not necessarily the amount that arrives at the surface. Remember when I said this? That super thick atmosphere and these shiny clouds reflect a bunch of it back into space. Venus is the most reflective of any of the eight planets. Very little light actually reaches the surface from space. It's not pitch black, but it is dark. Think just after dusk on a cloudy day. What Venus's atmosphere does with the outgoing infrared light is what keeps it so hot. Since planets like Venus are surrounded by empty space, the only way they can exchange heat with that space is through light. While the incoming light from the sun tries to warm the planet up, the planet also tries to cool off by emitting light, mostly in the infrared range. But you know how we have these things called greenhouses? They're really useful for growing plants because they let light in, but don't let the hot air out. It's a temperature regulation system. Planets do a similar thing to retain heat. It's called the greenhouse effect, but the mechanism is a little different than an actual greenhouse. For one, if a greenhouse gets too hot, they just open a vent. You can't do that on a planet. Also, planets aren't surrounded by glass, but they are surrounded by gas. I'm such a dork. Some of those gases absorb infrared light and send it back to the surface. They're called greenhouse gases because they help the planet hold in heat, kind of like a greenhouse. Any planet will find a balance between incoming and outgoing light, eventually. Remember the simple equation? Incoming light minus outgoing light? When those two factors are balanced, the planet is said to be in equilibrium. It's not heating up or cooling down uncontrollably. A weak greenhouse lets more infrared light leak into space. That'll give you a cold desert like we find on Mars. With a strong greenhouse, there's less infrared light leaking into space. That'll give you something like the hellscape we see on Venus. Now, we don't actually know that much about Venus's past. Resurfacing events have kind of wiped the slate clean. But this equation does tell us a little bit. It tells us that at some point in Venus's past, it was receiving far more light than it could emit. Venus could have easily started with a large shallow ocean. The increasing heat on the surface just evaporated it. But what if we caught that before it even began? If we were to move Venus to Mars's orbit now, nothing would change. The damage has already been done. It's a hellscape and likely will be for a very long time. But if in some alternate universe, Venus just formed there instead of Mars, it actually stands a chance. It's more massive than Mars, so its higher gravity would help it hold on to more atmosphere, which includes more human-friendly gases like oxygen and nitrogen. By the inverse square law, Venus would receive less light in its new orbit, less than a quarter of the light, which means about 69% of the incoming heat. But doesn't it still have the carbon dioxide? Yes, but not as much of it in its younger days. The habitable zone around a star is defined by the limits of the greenhouse effect. For various reasons, there are limits to how warm greenhouse gases can keep a planet's surface. Beyond this point, they just suck at it. Uh, at least the heavier ones that rocky planets like Venus can hold on to. If Venus formed out there, it could have found equilibrium before the climate got carried away. It could have been Earth 2.0, just kept warm with a little less light and a little more CO2. Mind you, this is all a bit speculative. As Dr. Kolos mentioned in our conversation. Plate tectonics is sort of a 
complex variable in this story. Geologic activity in the distant past can have wild effects on the present. The point is, we don't know if Venus would have been habitable in this alternate universe. But it would definitely have less incoming light and more outgoing light, which would have at least made it possible for Venus to be habitable. And if you ask me, th that's pretty cool. So, would you move to Venus if it formed in Mars's orbit? Let us know in the comments. If you want to listen to the entire conversation with Dr. Chris Kolos, I posted it to the second channel. Huge thanks to Chris for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks for liking and sharing this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with us. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. This episode was sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. There are lots of reasons you might want a website. If you don't have a coding background or good design instincts though, you're gonna have a rough time. With Squarespace, making a website is easy and quick. They have tons of design templates that look professional on all devices. Do you need your website to accept payments? Squarespace has a template for that. Do you need it to be shareable on social media? They have a template for that too. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash science asylum and add code science asylum at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase. So Yahtzee next? That would be so much harder because you count all your rolls together for one score. Stats clone might revolt. Besides, it seems as though people aren't interested in game analysis. Anyway, thanks for watching.